Jonathan Mole was a clerk in a court of Canadian law. He was also a very unhappy man. Jonathan Mole felt persecuted. Everyone he knew was out to get him. Many people he didn't know personally had it in for him too. During the day, he kept his bitterness to himself. At night, when he was alone, he turned to black magic. He took images of his enemies and wreaked his vengeance. certain of one thing. Canada, the land of his forefathers, was a dead loss. But one night, Jonathan Mole found himself in a land of his dreams. journey led to a frontier. Adenac was obviously exclusive, but the gates swung open for Mole. There was much that was the same, but there were differences. Adenac, there was no problem in choosing a flag. Everything in Adenac was black and white. They had their own mottos. They had their legislatures. And they had our national anthem. Oh, Adenac, so pure and white, so full of blinding truth and light. Those who live across the sea, who always speak of liberty, lack a masculinity, not to say gentility, and bushels of humility. Those of foreign extraction are a detraction, deplorable faction. In Adenac. Adenac was for Adenacians, pure and simple. To ensure that minority groups kept to their place, laws were needed. Article 1313, 13, subsection A, shall now read, Full freedom of opportunity is guaranteed to all native-born persons of Christian and Caucasian ancestry. In favor? Aye. Aye. Article 1313, subsection B, shall now read, All other elements of the population will be granted full freedom within their limitations. In favor? Aye. Aye. Such laws had to be tested, and so there were tribunals. Order in the tribunal. Court is now in session. Mr. Justice Jonathan Mole presiding. No longer was Mole a clerk. In Adenac, he was elevated to the bench. Proceed. 
May it please the court, the prosecution feels that much time could be saved if the three accused were tried jointly. Any objections from the defense? No objections, my lord. Prisoners will rise. Samuel Blue, Jew, William Brown, Red Indian, Peter White, immigrant. You are charged that on or about the 15th day of this month, you did apply for employment in the fields of high finance, the professions, and the artisan trades, respectively, contrary to Article 1313 of the Constitution of Adenac. I would ask the court to read the pertinent section. Subsection A. Full freedom of opportunity is guaranteed to all native-born persons of Christian and Caucasian ancestry. Subsection B, all other elements of the population will be granted full freedom within their limitations. I'll plead you. Not guilty. We do not intend, my lord, to deny the allegations that the accused did, in fact, apply for positions in the aforementioned fields. Blue, for a seat on the stock exchange. Brown, for admission to the School of Medicine. White, for his journeyman's papers in the Association of Cabinet Makers. I intend simply to contest the allegation that these men have limitations which exclude them from certain fields of endeavor. Prosecution may proceed. My Lord, it is the contention of the prosecution that when a true cross-section of our country do not want certain people in certain jobs, then these people are in fact not fit to be in such jobs. Such a cross-section of opinion will be called by the prosecution to bear witness before this court. We shall begin with Mrs. Patricia Platitude. Mrs. Patricia Platitude. Raise your right hand. Do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? I do. Mrs. Platitude, you're active in a host of organizations of a charitable and, shall we say, opinion-shaping nature. What is your opinion of Article 1313? Oh, it's one of the finest laws of our Constitution. <laughs> A very fine law. And I'm sure that our Jewish and Indian friends and the newcomers to the country uh, don't want to have to mix with us, the more established elements of the population. And why is that, Mrs. Platitude? Well, because they haven't had the opportunities, and I think it's asking perhaps a little too much of them. In short, madam, you feel that we have a duty to these people, a duty to protect them from their own possible folly. Well, particularly in the field of employment. I'm afraid if they had too much freedom, well, sometimes they just don't know what's best for them. But you know what's best for them. Well, I wouldn't, of course. But I'm sure my husband would. You're a sort of mother to these people. I like to think of myself that way, yes. And I suppose some of your best friends are Jews. No further questions. <laughs> Mr. Parrott, you are president of the Good Business Institute, as well as being a successful businessman. What is your opinion of the work application of the accused? Well, sir, I know that if I hired an Indian or a Jew or a DP, that my customers just wouldn't like it. Folks have come to me for years and to my dad before me. We're an old, established firm, and we hope to stay in business for a long time to come. Would you want an Indian doctor operating on you and yours, Mr. Parrott? Indeed, I wouldn't, sir. And why not, Mr. Parrott? Well, they're not as clean as a white man. Would you turn your finances over to a Jew? No, sir, I would not. Or entrust your children to an immigrant? Well, sometimes I have to. It's rather hard to get help these days, but I don't have to like it. And uh, would you want them as members of your club? Well, certainly not the Jews. Why not? Well, frankly, they're cliquish. Well, if they're so cliquish, why should they want to crash your gates? Well, they're, they're pushy. That's quite a trick, being both cliquish and pushy. At any rate, not up to your standards. 
I presume you would have rejected membership from Disraeli or Einstein. An extraordinary organization you belong to, Mr. Parrott. Extraordinary. Tell me, have you ever had any dealings personally with the accused? No, sir, I have not. I like to keep to my own kind. I read a bit, hear a bit, follow the rules. What rules? Well, the rules that the majority always... The rules of behavior. I don't make the rules, you know. You follow the crowd, Mr. Parrott. Yes, indeed, sir. The democratic way, sir. That will be all. Nasty business, Mr. Barrett. The cross we bear, Mrs. Platitude. Professor Shortsight, for the prosecution. Professor Shortsight, tell me, as a practical economist, what is your professional opinion of the employment question before us today? Bad business. Could you expand? Obvious. Immigrants willing to work cheaply, lower the standards, don't speak the language properly. Jews get into the credit business, debase the economy, uh, lack the Christian approach to money matters. Give an Indian money and he moves into better neighborhoods. White folk move out, values drop, out a slum. Immigrants willing to work cheaply, this man is in court because he wanted to earn more. Jews in the credit business. But this man wants a seat on the stock exchange. Give an Indian money and he creates a slum. Presumably if we starve him, we create model housing developments. Elmer Bigot for the prosecution. You swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God. I do. Mr. Bigot, you are a native of Adenac. I am that, sir. You are, in addition, uh, president of the Association for the Protection of Christian Rights. I am that, sir. Mr. Bigot, the accused are before this court today because they have applied for certain positions. I believe that you have facts of a general nature which should interest the court. I hope so, sir. I will speak plainly. I'm proud of my blood, my God, and my national heritage. I don't want Jews sticking their big beaks in where they're not wanted. I don't want a horde of Antichrist raids descending on my home and business. We are surrounded today on all sides by black and yellow peril. In addition, there are the so-called whites, which threaten the very cornerstones of our nation. For years, the Jews have been cheating us blind in our businesses. Now we have mobs of DPs coming in to pick up the few crumbs the Semites have left us. It's time to stiffen the Christian backbone. I know the court admires a man of strong and forthright opinion, Mr. Bigot. But this tribunal is interested in fresh facts. I'll give you the facts, sir. But they're hardly fresh. They're facts any schoolboy knows or should know. Give an Indian a dime and he'll buy a drink. Give him a dollar and he's drunk. That's if he can rouse himself long enough to raise the bottle. Lazy, louts. But this man wants to be a doctor. I doubt if there's much call for medicine men these days. I don't need to expand on the Jewish question. The grasping hand of the Jew at this moment controls the machinery of international high finance. There is strong evidence that they are backing a communist conspiracy for world domination. The Bible says the sins of the father are visited on the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me and who killed Christ. The Jew. That's who. But Christ was a Jew. An accident of birth. Thank you, Mr. Bigot. I wrestle with the disturbing vision of the Jew who is a monstrous capitalist and a hot-eyed revolutionary at the same time. Tell me, Mr. Bigot, do all Chinese carry knives? Most of them do, I understand. And all Negroes carry razors? Yes, so I'm told. Just one further question, Mr. Bigot. Where do you get your facts? A bigot's facts are passed from father to son, 
A bigot like an elephant never forgets. When his maker calls, he carries the facts of a lifetime to the world hereafter. A bigot like an elephant appears to have a very thick hide. That'll be all. That is the case for the prosecution, my lad. Counsel for the defense may proceed. You're an economist, Dr. Longrun. These men are charged under Article 1313. What is your opinion of such an act? An expensive luxury. In what way? Well, firstly, there are many potential leaders among immigrants, Jews, and Indians. By refusing them opportunities, we're shortchanging the country. Secondly, you can't limit part of the population to low-wage jobs without creating slums. Slums breed disease and crime. These are expensive byproducts. Is it true that Jews control international banking? No, it's untrue. Statistically, there are far fewer Jews per capita in the field of high finance than there are Christians. In Adonai, a Jew has trouble getting work as a bank teller. Dr. Matter, for the defense. I find it difficult to detect any difference in these exhibits. As an anthropologist, Dr. Matter, how can one distinguish between the different races of mankind? The differences are entirely superficial and purely physical. Skin a human, any human, and the basic framework is much the same. But what about the brain? Among the human races, there is no difference in the size, shape, or convolutions of the brain. I don't see a Jew among your exhibits. The Jews are members of the, the Caucasoid race, along with you and me. Slight ethnic difference, but no racial difference whatsoever. And no race, Doctor, is inherently weaker, physically or mentally, than any other? Absolutely not. Is any race less able to hold its liquor? No. In the case of the Indian, he got drunk quite quickly when first exposed to alcohol. But this can happen to anyone. He was somewhat behind us in his vices, but the white man has remedied this. Today, alcohol has no greater effect on the Indian than it has on the white man. The prosecutor, I believe, boasts of a long British ancestry. Who might be members of his family tree? The English descend from Angles, Saxons, Jutes, Danes, Normans, a smattering of Roman, and perhaps a little picked. In conclusion, Doctor, is it safe to say that no race or ethnic group, no matter how pure, is inherently inferior in matters of ability, intelligence, or physique? That is a very safe statement, sir. Then there is no anthropological reason why any group should be excluded from any profession they may wish to take up. None whatsoever. Would you want your sister to marry an Indian? No, I wouldn't. I didn't think so. Not because he's an Indian, but because discrimination in Adenac would make life terribly difficult for them. If they really wanted to marry, I would admire their courage and support their choice. Dr. Mine, you've heard the prosecution witnesses. As a social psychologist, would you say they suffered from a psychological disorder? Yes, they suffer from prejudice. And Article 1313, prohibiting certain groups entry into certain professions. Such a law merely legalizes the discrimination that stems from prejudice. It is therefore unhealthy. None of the witnesses have even a passing acquaintance with the uh, accused. Yet they attribute a frightening assortment of the world's ills to these men. To the witnesses, the accused do not exist as men. They exist only as symbols of stereotyped ideas.
Would you say the witnesses for the prosecution had overgeneralized? They have, and therefore their arguments are invalid. In this case, the generalizations are particularly dangerous because they're pure fantasy. There are money-grubbing Jews, drunken Indians, unprincipled immigrants. I know of some, but I know of many Anglo-Saxons with the same deficiencies. This is an age of enlightenment, Doctor. Why does prejudice remain rooted in so many otherwise intelligent minds? People may be prejudiced for several reasons. It may be economic. There's nothing like an inexhaustible supply of uh, cheap labor. Or it may be guilt. Evil deeds must be justified. A convenient prejudice is constructed. The demagogue finds this helps. Die Partei! Hitler aber ist Deutschland! Die Deutschland Hitler ist! Hitler! Sieg! Sieg! Often prejudice is needed to bolster prestige. People with no visible distinction dwell on a rosy fantasy. They believe gallons of high test blood course invisibly through their veins. Those a bit shy on background attach themselves to exclusive organizations. Then there's the simple conformist. He may be a jolly good fellow. He follows the leader. Unfortunately, he does not discriminate in his choice of leaders. Most often, prejudice is a result of frustration. His boss yells. His wife nags. His life is miserable. He may have himself to blame, but this is unsatisfying. He searches for a scapegoat, someone weaker than himself. And on this scapegoat, he unloads his own troubles, and often the troubles of the world. Like a child, the prejudiced man joins the mob and attacks the outsider. And what effect does prejudice have on the victim? Well, very often it creates a vicious circle. The scapegoat must strive harder to succeed and he may become overly aggressive. I believe pushy was the word used. They may have to band together for their own protection. They are then accused of being cliquish. Sometimes the scapegoat just quits, and then he is accused of being lazy. Sometimes he is forced into unsavory professions, and is then accused of preferring them. Poverty forces him to steal, and he is accused of being inherently criminal. And what is the effect on society as a whole? A society which discriminates is a dangerous society. No group is safe. The most hallowed institutions of today may become the target of mass hatred tomorrow. Would you say that prejudice was detrimental to the prejudiced man himself? Of course. He shuts out most of his world. His mind is closed to fresh ideas. His fears breed more fear. He's so busy tilting at windmills that he has no time to struggle with the real evils of the world. He is narrow and insecure. He has a disease and an unpleasant one. Theories, theories and distortions! No need to shout, Mr. Prosecutor. That is the case for the defense, my lord. The prosecution may begin his summation. Our case is simple, my lord. My witnesses are not cut from the same cloth. 
They range from the liberal-minded to the more conservative. However, they all agree on one point, that the accused do have limitations and should therefore be limited in their opportunities. It is the contention of the prosecution that if these undesirables are allowed to enter into any occupation which might suit their fancy, we will open the doors on the 101 evils which our people fear, and fear with justification. Prosecution rests. And the defense? It appears, my lord, that the crime of the Indian is that he has been here too long. The crime of the immigrant is that he has not been here long enough. The crime of the Jew is that he is here at all. The case of the prosecution has been built on fear, on hate, and on stupidity. I am not here to dwell on the moral aspects of this case. Christ said, love thy neighbor as thyself. Article 1313 is opposed to the teachings of Christ. I have nothing to add to the testimony of the witnesses for the defense. They have brought to this courtroom business sense, common sense, and common humanity. On that, the defense rests. The court will now recess while the verdict is being deliberated. The court will not recess. Lengthy deliberation is unnecessary. A clear case has been made. The accused will rise. The accused will rise. People being people, and the law being the law, you men are, of course, guilty. And I so find you. Now, I know you men did not realize you were going to cause so much trouble and fuss, and I have no intention of punishing you. On the contrary, it is the duty of this court to protect the many rights and privileges that you men possess. A place for every man, and every man in his place, as we say. There's no need for anyone to starve. First, the Jewish chap. Mr. Blue, is it? You wanted to be a stockbroker. Well, your people are good traders. You might try the clothing business, say. Economy clothing for people of limited means. Extend a little credit. Oh, there's the entertainment business, a host of opportunities. Now our Indian friend. Medicine for an Indian? You wouldn't like being cooped up in a city. There is a cry for hard workers from our far-flung frontiers. Go forth to the wilderness from whence you came. Fulfill your destiny. Do what you can do well. Hunt, trap, fish. Now, White, you wanted to get into a highly skilled trade. As a new member of our community, you'll probably have to spend some time learning our language. Does he understand us? Oh, yes, my lord. It is true we have found English a difficult language, but we have labored strenuously to improve it. Our children are going to school. Yes, 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 yes. Well, your people like to stick to the city. There's still plenty of fresh air in the city and lots of work in uh, construction or sanitation, nothing like honest toil, sweat of the brow. And now let us adjourn. Everyone is free, more or less, to go. Tribunal is adjourned. God save the nation. And so Jonathan Mole, Chief Justice of the Land, signified his approval of a law limiting freedom.
This was his kind of world. Those with breeding were called to high places. It remained for the others to see that the shoes were well shined and the shirts well laundered and the ditches well dug. Jonathan Mole faced another dreary day of grim reality. He would go back to his job in the courthouse and listen to arguments over the rights of man and the dignity of the individual. Drivel, thought Jonathan Mole, the work of the devil. But there was hope. Every day in Canada he saw scraps of discrimination. Nothing worthwhile, mind you but perhaps enough to build comfortably bigoted surroundings. He would work on it. 